In this tutorial, we are going to discuss what is OAuth2 and how to implement OAuth2 features in Spring Boot applications using Spring Security. We will also have a look at how to implement OAuth2 patterns for different kinds of applications like server-side rendered applications which are developed using Spring MVC, single page applications which are developed using frameworks like Angular and also have a look at how to implement machine to machine authorization like in the case of microservices. We will use Keycloak as our identity server or authorization server to help us implement these OAuth2 patterns. If you are not aware of these terms OAuth2 and identity server don't worry, we will cover everything in this tutorial. So to follow along this tutorial, a basic understanding of Spring Boot and Spring Security is recommended. So without any further delay, let's start the video. So what is OAuth2? The term OAuth stands for Open Authorization and it's an industry standard protocol that was developed for authorization between services or applications. And this protocol is right now in version 2.0. That's why it's usually known as OAuth2. Let's understand this better with an example. So I am a user of a website or mobile application, which is an image gallery application. This application's functionality is simple. The user uploads a photo and can apply different filters and frames around the photo, which he or she uploaded. And we can also print these photos. So now in recent times, everyone is using cloud services to store images like Google Photos, iCloud or Google Drive. So if you want to access the photos which are stored inside your Google account or maybe Facebook account from this image gallery application, you have to provide permissions for this application to access your Google or Facebook account. You can't just hand over the username and password of your Google or Facebook account to this application because that is very risky as this application can store your credentials to the database and if a hacker gets access to this database, you are in trouble. So we need a safe way to authorize the image gallery application so that it can access our Google or Facebook account. The OAuth framework was developed for this reason. It's a standard way of providing authorization that means, that means permission for a service A, in our case the image gallery application, to access service B, which is a user's Google or Facebook account. When the framework was initially developed, it was just called as OAuth. But later, an updated version 2.0 was released in 2013, so which is called as OAuth2. Also, as I mentioned before, the A in OAuth stands for authorization but not authentication because we are providing authorization for a service to access another service. For this reason, OAuth2 is also called as delegated authorization. Now, as the OAuth concept is clear, let's zoom in a little bit and see how the actual authorization flow looks like. So we have our user accessing the image gallery application and this application wants to access the photos stored in Google Drive. So instead of asking for Google credentials, the application will redirect us to the login page of Google. And once we log in, we can grant our permissions for the image gallery application to access the Google account thereby the Google Drive account. We can also restrict what all permissions we can give to the image gallery application. In this example, we want the application to only view our photos, but not edit or delete them. Once we grant the permission, the Google server will return a unique access token back to the application. And our application can use this access token to access the photos from our Google account. Once the Google server receives this access token, it verifies whether it's a valid token or not. If it confirms whether it's a valid token, that means a token which is generated by the Google server itself, it will grant access to the photos. In this way, we can only provide limited access to our photos in the Google Drive so that it can just so that the image gallery application can just view our photos but do nothing else. And if required, we can also revoke the access of this application by changing the settings in your Google account. So this is a high level overview of how the OAuth protocol works. In the next section, we'll have a look at commonly used OAuth terminology to understand this better. So we saw on a high level how OAuth works, but to implement OAuth and understand different kinds of OAuth flows, you need to get familiarized with different types of OAuth terminology. The first one is called as a resource or a protected resource. In our image gallery application example, we saw earlier the resource or a protected resource is the image or photos stored inside our Google Drive account. So anything which needs to be accessed by an external service and which needs the authorization to access it is called as a resource. The next term is called as a resource owner. As the name suggests, this means the owner of the resource. In this case, it would be me or you, the person who is the owner of the photos. The next term is called resource server. So this is the server that stores or hosts the resource. In our case, it's the Google Drive server that stores our photos. The next term is called 
a client which is the service or application which is accessing the resource in our case it's the image gallery application so this client can be a web mobile desktop application or it can be a standalone service like a microservice or even a device like a smart tv so we also have a couple of categories in clients a client can be a public client which means a mobile application or a web or desktop application and the other type of category is a confidential client so this can be a microservice or a cron job running on a remote server so for each client we have different kinds of authorization flows also called grant types which means for different kinds of client we have different ways or mechanisms to get the access tokens we will discuss this also in details in the coming sections so the last term we are going to have a look is the authorization server so this is the server that will generate and provide access tokens to the client and will also verify whether an access token is valid or not there are many options available for the authorization server in the market so you have amazon's aws cognito google's identity platform and okta as the famous authorization servers if you want to manage the authorization on your own keycloak is a very good option it's an open source offering and in this tutorial we'll mainly see how to implement oauth2 patterns using keycloak so as you understood what is oauth2 you also need to know something called as oidc also known as open id connect this is a protocol which is built on top of oauth2 which mainly acts as an identity layer so what do i mean by identity layer so previously we saw that when the client wants to access a resource like your photos on google drive it needs an access token from the authorization server this access token is basically a random alphanumerical set of characters which basically does not provide any context or information about the user so which makes it hard for the clients to understand and get the user information for this reason the identity layer will send an additional token called an id token which contains basic information about the user like email first name and last name so when the user requests a token he or she will receive now will now receive two tokens as part of open id connect one is an access token and the other one is an id token the access token will be used to verify whether the user contains necessary permissions to access the user or not and the id token will be used to verify the user information itself so this is the main difference between oauth2 and open id connect in the later chapters we will also have a look at how this id token and the access token looks like so you can understand it much better so for now let's move on to the next topic so as i said before we are going to use the keycloak authorization server in this tutorial and if you are not already aware of keycloak keycloak is an open source identity and access management server it's a very popular and widely used authorization server in the industry to get started with keycloak you can download it by going to the downloads page you can either select a standalone installation or a docker download i'm going to go ahead with the standard installation and i already downloaded the keycloak software to my machine so once you download keycloak uh, you have to unzip and open the bin folder in the terminal and to start the keycloak server you have to type the command kc.sh start dev and i'm going to provide the argument http port as 8180 so if you are running uh, the command prompt on windows you may have to type the command um, let me type this kc.bat start dev and provide the http port as again 8180 so once you run this um, command the server will run in development mode so we are not creating the server in this production mode but as you are running in the development local development environment i am starting it in the start dev argument so you can see that the keycloak server is now running on the port 8180 once the server is up and running open the browser and go to the address http localhost 8180 you will be asked to create an initial admin user account to get started and access the server just provide a username and password of your choice and click on the create button once the user is created we can log in to our authorization server by clicking on the administration console option and now you can see the login page i'm going to type in my admin account credentials and click on login so now you can see that i'm logged in to the admin console and the first thing you will observe is something called as a master something called a master which is the default realm in keycloak so a realm is like a placeholder where you can manage a set of clients users and their roles so each realm is not is not connected with each other so if i create a user in one realm they are not available or accessible from another realm okay so the first thing we are going to do now is to create our own realm by clicking on add realm button here i will provide a name to the realm and click on create button 
So now you can see that the realm is created and activated automatically. Now I can create as many clients under this realm and also as many users and role I want under this realm. So now let's go ahead and create a client. This client is going to be a Spring MVC application which is developed using Thymeleaf. So this is going to be a server side Spring MVC application. So to create this client, I'm going to click on client section and click on create. This will bring up an add client page. In here, I have to provide the client ID. I'm going to provide this as OAuth demo time leaf client and click on save. Now you can see that we see much more details inside the client page. So the first option we see is called as client authentication. So if you just hover over this tooltip, you can see the text that uh, this defines the type of the OIDC client when it's on. The OIDC type is set to confidential access type. When it's off, it's set to public access type. So now in this demo, I want to create a, a confidential client because this application is going to be a server side rendered Spring MVC application, which is using Thymeleaf. So in this case, the client details uh, will be stored inside the browser, inside the server itself. So I'm just going to enable this option, client authentication to on. We are going to leave the authorization option as off for now. We are coming to the authentication flows. We are just going to enable the standard flow here. So this is going to be authorization code flow. And uh, coming to the direct access grant, I'm going to disable this option because uh, by using this option, the user can directly get a token using the username and password. So we don't want to do that in this demo. So I'm just going to disable this option and I'm going to click on next. And the next field we are interested in is the valid redirect URI. This will be the redirect URI, which the authorization server will use to send us the authorization code as we saw earlier. So for this field, I'm going to provide the value HTTP localhost 8080 slash login slash OAuth2 slash code slash OAuth2 code demo timelift client. So which is the client ID which we have provided before. So this is the default redirect URI which Spring Boot supports and which is also according to the OAuth2 conventions. So this is recognized by our Spring Embassy application. You don't need to implement this endpoint. Spring will automatically handle the request when Keycloak will redirect to this particular URI. So that's all we need to do. Now we can click on save. Okay, now we have to do one last thing inside the client page that is to generate a client secret. We can do that by clicking on the credentials tab. The client secret was already generated for us. So if you need, we can regenerate the secret and we will come back to this once we configured our Spring MVC application. And also we have to create a user so that we can log into our application. We can do that by clicking on the user section on the left side. So here we can view all users and also add a new user. I'm going to click on add new user and here I'm going to type the username and click on save. This will create the user successfully and to set a password, I'm going to click on the credentials tab and in here I'm going to provide a random password. Here we also have the option to select whether the password is going to be a temporary password or not. If you select this option, the very first time you log in, it will ask you to change the password. So let's leave this option on and click on OK and set password. OK, so we installed Keycloak, configured admin credentials, created a realm, a client and a user. So that's all we need to do. Now let's go ahead and implement our demo application. All right, now let's see how the authorization code flow works in practice. We're going to develop a Spring MVC application to implement authorization code flow. I already have the finished application ready and running. So what I'm going to do right now is open a browser window and open the browser tools in this and the network tab. In this way, we can see the network calls our application is going to make. So I'm going to open the URL HTTP localhost 8080 slash home. As soon as I press enter, you can see that an initial authorization request is triggered by the browser to the endpoint to authorize. And if you check the request parameters, we have a response type as code, a state parameter and a redirect URI. So the Keycloak server will make a request to this redirect URI after the successful authentication along with the authorization code. We'll have a look at it shortly. And lastly, we also have the client ID as one of the request parameter. So as soon as the Keycloak server received this request, it responds with a login page. So I'm going to provide the credentials of the user I created in the previous section.
and observe carefully here right after I click on login you can see that we now have a call to the redirect URI as I mentioned before and if you look at the query string parameters you can see the parameters state session state and the important parameter code so this is the authorization code our application will use to request the token now as this is a server side rendered application I cannot show you how I cannot show you the call to the token endpoint as it is done in the background by our Spring Boot application. So this is the demo part. Now let's go ahead to the more interesting section that is for the implementation. For that, the first thing you have to do is to download the starter code. You can find the link to the source code in the description section of this video. And once you open the GitHub code, you can check out the code and switch to the branch name initial. So this branch contains the starter template for this tutorial. So we can get started right away and we don't need to spend time in setting up the initial project. So once you check out the code, make sure you run the class demo application. It should be starting without any errors. So now let's set up the application. The first thing we are going to do is to add the OAuth2 dependency to our Spring Boot application. I'm going to open the form.xml file and under the dependency section, I'm going to add the dependency Spring Boot Starter OAuth2 Client. After adding this annotation, make sure to refresh the Maven configuration by clicking on the icon to the top right side corner if you're using IntelliJ. So if you love, if you now have a look at the pom.xml, we have dependencies for Spring Web, which will activate the Spring MVC module in our project, and also the Timelift Starter, which will enable the Timelift features. And the last dependency is for testing, which we are not going to cover as part of this tutorial. However, if you are interested, I covered this part already in my channel through a, a practical example. So you can, you can have a look at the playlist in the description section. Now our Spring Boot application is ready to be configured with the OAuth2 capabilities. So the first thing I'm going to do is to create a package called as controller under the root project and under this package now I'm going to create a class called as home controller this is going to be the controller which will serve our initial request to the application above the class I'm going to add the controller annotation and inside the class I'm going to create a method called as home which contains the written type as string and inside the method, I'm going to return the string called home. This is going to be the name of the HTML file, which is going to serve the request. No surprises here. It's pretty straightforward Spring MVC code. And lastly, I'm going to add the get mapping annotation to the method with the value as home. So whenever the browser sends a request to the server with the request mapping home, it will redirect the request to the home.html page. Now let's go to the resources folder and here I'm going to create the home.html file under the template section. And this is going to be uh, just a boring HTML file. Nothing special here. I'm going to add a H1 tag with some welcome message inside the body tag. Okay, so next we are going to configure the OAuth2 client properties inside our Spring Boot application. For that, I'm going to open the application.properties file and I'm going to type spring.security.oauth2.client.registration followed by a registration key. I'm going to provide the same name as the client ID we gave before, oauth 2 demo timelift client. So you don't need to provide this exact name. You can give any name you like. And I'm going to add the property key client ID. The value of this property is going to be the client ID of the client we created in the previous section. The next property is going to be client secret. So I'm going to copy the whole property. I'm going to copy the client secret from the key clock server and copy it inside the application.properties file. If needed, you can regenerate this client secret. And uh, the next property is going to be scope. Here you can define different scopes and roles if you want to deal with roles in your application. By default, we are going to have the scope as open ID, profile and roles. The next property is going to be the type of authorization grant type, which is authorization code, which is the present example we are dealing with. So followed by the property redirect URI. As I mentioned before, this is the URL which our key cloak server will call when the authentication is successful. We don't need to implement any logic to handle the redirect. Spring Boot security will do this for us out of the box. And also this redirect URI is defined according to the OAuth2 specifications. So all the magic will be done by Spring Security here. And lastly, we have to provide the property called issuer URI, 
This value you can find it by by going to the Keycloak URL, open your Realm settings, and click on the endpoint OpenID configuration. Here you can see all the URLs which belong to our Realm and uh, which are defined as part of the as part of the OAuth through conventions. So we have the endpoint to start the authorization flow and the endpoint to get the token. For this reason, instead of adding all these values one by one, we can provide only the issuer URI to Spring Boot and it can refer to this endpoint to make any calls uh, that it needs. So if it needs to request a token, it can call the token endpoint. And if it needs to verify the token, it can call the introspection endpoint. And if it needs to get the user info, it will call the user info endpoint and so on and so forth. So I'm going to copy this value and paste it inside the application.properties file. So that's all we need to do to configure the OAuth 2 client properties in our Spring Boot application. So we provided all the necessary information. Now let's start our server and open the URL HTTP localhost 8080 slash home again. So you should be redirected to the Keycloak login page. I'm going to type in my credentials and log in. PKC authorized code flow spelled as Pixie authorization code flow stands for proof of key code exchange authorization. This grant type was created to be used for public facing clients, for example, web applications, which are developed using JavaScript frameworks like Angular, React or Vue, and also mobile applications. The Pixie authorization code flow is mainly considered as a best practice to follow when we are using public clients. The main reason for using these kinds of uh, different authorization code flow is because if you remember as part of the authorization code flow we saw previously that to get the access token and ID token pair from the authorization server the client needs to make a post request with the client ID client secret and the authorization code so that means we have to store the client secret somewhere in the client to be able to make a post call for the token endpoint this is very risky because any web developer can view the source code of the JavaScript applications and find the client secret if we store it in the client. So the same also applies for the mobile application. So if you have the APK file and uh, you can decompile or uh, decrypt decompile that APK file to view the source code. So it's not safe at all to store the client secret inside the client source code. So for this reason, a new type of authorization code flow was designed, which is the Pixie, uh, which is the Pixie enhanced authorization code flow. This flow is very similar to the authorization code flow, but with a couple of additional steps. And also there is also no need to maintain the client secret anymore in the client by using this approach, as I said before. So let's see. So let's go ahead and see how it looks like. The Pixie authorization code flow, similar to authorization code flow, will make an initial request to the authorized endpoint of the Keycloak server with some query parameters. Parameters we are sending are almost similar to what we sent as part of the authorization code flow. So if you need to understand why we need these parameters, have a look at part one of this video. I'm not going to repeat this information again. So as part of the Pixie authorization code flow, we are going to send two additional URL parameters. The first one is called as code challenge which is a base64 encoded random string which is generated by hashing and encoding another value generated by the client called as code verifier. The next parameter is called as code challenge method which should be configured inside our authorization server when we are first configuring the client. The recommended value for this code challenge method parameter is S256 which is a cryptographic hashing function. Once the clients make this request to the authorization server the server responds with the login page asking for the user to authenticate. Once the user logs in, the authorization server returns an authorization code similar to the authorization code flow we saw in part one of the series. But now to request an access token, the client should send the code verifier value along with the authorization code as part of the post request to the token endpoint. When the authorization server receives this post request, it validates the authorization code and the code verifier values and then responds with an access token and ID token pair. Once the client gets this token, it can now make the request to access the resource to the resource server and the resource server will first validate whether the token is valid or not. So this is how the Pixie authorization code flow works. Hope you have understood this theory. Now let's see this grant flow in practice and then implement it using Spring Boot and an Angular application. Okay, so now let's see the Pixie authorization code flow grant type in practice. 
For this, I already started the front end and back end applications. And in the browser, I have the network tab open. And uh, I'm going to hit the endpoint localhost 4200. And in here, you can see the link login. If I click on it, you can see similar to the authorization code grant type, we had the we have the initial authorization request to the Keycloak server, which returns a login page. If you check the parameters, which are part of the authorization request, you can see the response type as code, the client ID, and a state parameter. The additional parameter added to this request URL is the code challenge and code challenge method. These values are generated by our Angular application and the Keycloak server responded with a login page for this request. Now let's go ahead and log in. I'm going to type in my credentials and click on the login button. Now you can see the request which is made to the redirect URI. If you check the query string parameters again, we see the same query parameters as the previous authorization code flow. We have the state parameter, the state session and code. Our Angular application will use this code to make a post request to the token endpoint as this is a public Angular application. So if we have a look at this request, it goes by the name token. So it's easy to identify. And as I mentioned before, this will be a post request with the request body as the authorization grant type, the authorization code, the redirect URI and client ID. Lastly, we have a new parameter called code verifier. This value is used to verify the code challenge method, the code, the value code challenge, just as explained in the previous section. Now, if you check the response of this call, you can see the value for the access token, the expiry time of this token, followed by the refresh token and its expiry time. So if our client needs to make any calls to a resource server, it can make use of this access token. And if the client and if the access token is expired, it can use the refresh token to request a new access token. Now, this is how the Pixie authorized code flow works. So let's go ahead and see how to implement this grant type. Okay, so first of all, we are going to start by creating a client inside Keycloak. For that, make sure you have the Keycloak server up and running and open the address localhost 8180 and log in with your admin credentials. Now, if you click on the clients tab and click on create button, we are going to provide the client ID as OAuth2 demo pixie client and click on save. And now here we have to make some changes. So I'm going to leave the client authentication as off. So if you see, select the tooltip here, uh, we have already saw, we already saw that if our OIDC client is of uh, public, then we have to switch the toggle off. And uh, the uh, info pixie uh, authorization code flow, our, our client is going to be an Angular application. So for this reason, I'm just going to leave this client authentication as off and coming to the authentication flow itself, I'm going to select the standard flow which is indeed the um, which is indeed the authorization code flow and uh, I'm going to uh, deselect the direct access grants one more time and I'm going to click on next here and we have to provide the value for valid redirect URI. So this is the URI where the authorization server will send the authorization code and the client reads the code. So I'm going to provide here the value localhost 4200, which is the address of the Angular application. The next value we have to provide is for the web origins. So this would be the allowed course origins, which can access the authorization server. So we are going to provide a star here as we are going to permit all origins. So when you are using this for production applications, please don't provide a star value here and only provide the valid origin of the redirect URI we are going to use. So that means if your front-end application is running on a server, provide the host details of the server instead of allowing all origins. All right, so the next value we are going to configure is the pixie enhanced code challenge method. You can find this value under the advanced settings and I'm going to select the value as S256, which is a cryptographic hashing function, which will be applied on the code verifier value. So if you select plain, there won't be any hashing performed on the code verifier and this is not a secured option and this is highly discouraged. So that's it for the client configuration. I'm going to click on save. So now let's go ahead and dive into the code. So similar to part one of this video, you can download the starter code from the GitHub repo. You can find the repository in the description section of this video. So the main branch contains the completed code and the starter code is provided in the initial branch. So if you're stuck for any reason, you can refer to the completed code in the main branch. So in this video, we are mainly interested in the Pixie authorization code flow. So once you open the OAuth2 Pixie demo project under the source main resources folder, you will see a folder called frontend, which contains the code for the Angular application. So the first thing we're going to do is to install a package called Angular OAuth2 OIDC 
inside our Angular application. This package will provide OAuth 2 capabilities for our Angular application by just writing some minimal code. So this package supports both authorization code flow and Pixie enhanced authorization code flow. So let's go ahead and add these details inside the package.json file. So at the time of creating this video, the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC package is on version 10.0.3. So once you have added this dependency, run npm install to download and install the package to your machine. Okay, now we have to configure the client details inside the application. For that, I'm going to create a new file called auth.config.ts inside the app folder. And inside this file, I'm going to define an object called auth.config, which is of type auth.config coming from the Angular OAuth2 OIDC library. So I'm going to type export const auth.config and declare the return type of the object. And inside the object, I'm going to define six fields. The first one is going to be the issuer URI. So if you have watched the part one, I already discussed what is issuer URI in detail. So please have a look at this video if you didn't watch it yet. So this issuer URI contains all the list of configuration endpoints, which is exposed by the authorization server. So you saw in the theory part that our client is going to make multiple calls to the authorization server. The first one is the initial authorized request and followed by the token endpoint request. And subsequently, it will also make a request to refresh the token if needed. So instead of hard coding all the endpoints in the application, you can just provide the issuer URI, which will expose the list of endpoints. And then the client can use this list of endpoints and call, and call whatever uh, endpoint is required. Okay, the next value is going to be redirect URI. This is the same value we provided when configuring the client in the previous section. So instead of hard coding this value inside our code, we can provide the JavaScript window object like window.location.origin, which will return the address of the web application. The next value is going to be the client ID, which is OAuth2 demo pixie client. Again, we have to provide the same value as we provide inside the client. So it's better to copy this value from the client information in Keycloak and paste it here. The next value is going to be response type. This is going to be code as we are following authorization code flow mechanism. Even if it's pixie enhanced, we provide the value as code itself. So the next value is going to be strict discovery document validation. So this is something which is relevant to this Angular OAuth 2 OIDC library. So we are going to provide it as true. So this is used when the list of endpoints exposed by the issuer URI endpoint does not contain the same base URI as the issuer endpoint. So what do I mean by that? So if I open the open ID configuration of our realm, you can see that by visiting the realm page inside our Keycloak server, and click on open id configuration link you can see that the base url of all the urls are same because we are using keycloak as the authorization server it is going to be consistent so if for any reason we anticipate the base url is not going to be consistent across all these urls then we'll provide the value as false so in those cases our application will not validate the discovery document that is the json we are seeing we are seeing here for the base urls all right moving ahead we have the last parameter called scope here i am going to provide some default scopes like open id profile email and offline access after configuring these values now let's implement the flow it's very easy i'm going to open the app component html page and remove all the default html which exists inside the file and I'm going to replace it with just some bare bone HTML code. So I'm going to add an anchor tag with text called login and another anchor tag with text logout. So if I click on this link in the browser, it should make the authorized call to the authorization server as seen in the theory, which is step one. So to do that, I'm going to make use of the out of the box functionality provided by the Angular OAuth2 OIDC package. So I'm going to first inject the OAuth service class into the component, which is coming in from the library. Make sure to import the class into the component. And after injecting the service, we should provide the auth config details to the service. We can do that by first creating a method called as configure. So let's define and create this method. And inside the method, I'm going to type this dot OAuth service dot configure and pass in the OAuth config object as the argument. Also, make sure to import this object into the component. Now I'm going to type this dot OAuth service dot load discovery document and try login. So what this method call will do is to make a call to the issuer URI 
and get all the necessary endpoint required to trigger the login flow. Okay, now we are ready to trigger the login flow. For that, we can make use of the convenience methods provided by the Angular auth to OIDC package. For that, I'm going to create two methods, login and logout. So first, inside the login method, I'm going to type this dot OAuth service dot init code flow, which will kick off the authorization code flow. And inside the logout method, I'm going to type this dot OAuth service dot logout which will take care of logging out of the application automatically. So you see how it is, how easy it is to implement authentication and authorization using this library. So it makes our life easier as the developers. And if you want to implement it manually, so it's going to take lots of time and effort to do it. So due to this flexibility provided by the libraries, it's important for us developers to do due diligence and understand how it's working under the hood. So that's where the videos like this are going to help you. So if you like it so far, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel to make uh, to check out more interesting tutorials like this. All right, now let's come back to our tutorial. So we configured the required methods inside the app component TypeScript file, but we are not yet calling these methods from our HTML file. So let's open the app component HTML and call the login and logout methods when clicking on this link. So I'm going to use the click directive and pass in the login and logout methods, method uh, definitions there. So now if I click on the login link from the browser, it should kick off the pixie authorization code flow mechanism. All right, now let's start up our Angular application. For that, I'm going to type npm start in the terminal and make sure you are in the front end directory. And once the application is started up, open localhost 4200. So now you can see that we don't see any um, any links here any hyperlinks with login or logout because we have an error because the OAuth service is not understandable by the angular modules for our angular application this is because we have to define the OAuth module inside the op mod app modules.ts file so i'm going to open the app module.ts file and in there i'm going to inside under the import section i'm going to type OAuth module dot for root and inside here inside the configuration section I'm going to provide the object for resource server and inside there I'm going to provide what are the allowed URLs for the resources server so this is going to be HTTP localhost 8080 slash API we did not yet create the resource server but we will do it shortly you will have a look at it shortly and the second um, and the second variable is going to be send access token true so we are also going to see in detail like what does actually this mean this particular variable and uh, declaration means so now as we have done that uh, we will also define the http client module because we will make a call to the resource server and we need uh, access for the http client to make a get request so in this way we are covered also for the http client module to be accessed from our angular application so once you've done that uh, you can restart the Angular application and uh, open the browser again, the localhost 4200 and refresh the page. And now you can see two text values, login and logout. And I'm going to first open the dev tools and network tab. So you can see the network calls while logging into the application. Click on the link login, it will open the login page. And as part of the first request, you can see the value code challenge, which is generated by the Angular over to OIDC package. And we are also sending the code challenge method as S256, which is the same value as we configured inside the Keycloak uh, client. So the rest of the query parameters are similar to the authorization code flow. And uh, coming back to the browser window, I'm going to type in my credentials, which I created in part one of this series. And once I click on login, and if we check the network tab inside the dev tools again, you can see that it made the call to authenticate followed by the open ID configuration call. So this is the discovery document, which is returned by the authorization server. So if you see the response, you can see all the information we saw before here. And uh, the client will make use of this data to make a token endpoint post call to the authorization server. So you can see that also, you can also see that it sent the grant type as code, the authorization code it received from the key cloak, the redirect URI, the code verifier, which is generated by the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC package, and the client ID. 
So once the Keyclock server receives this request, it will decode the code challenge value provided as part of the initial request. So you can see here in the diagram in step one, using the S256 cryptographic hashing function and verifies whether it's same as the code verifier or not. If yes, then it will respond with access token and ID token. And uh, the token value is stored inside the session storage by default as I'm using an, in an incognito window. So you can use this access token to request the resource server and access the protected resource. So this is how we implement Pixie authorization code flow on the client side. Now let's implement the resource server part. So if you go back to the source code, we have our Spring Boot application which just contains a main class as of now. So to configure the resource server, we have to first add some dependencies to enable OAuth2 resource server capabilities. For that, I'm going to open the pom.xml and add in three dependencies. The first one is going to be Spring Boot Starter OAuth2 resource server, which will enable the resource server capabilities inside our Spring Boot application, followed by Spring Security OAuth2 Jose dependency, which will also enable the JavaScript object signing and encryption framework, shortly called as Jose framework, which is used to securely transfer claims between two parties. This means transferring the JSON web tokens, the JSON web signatures, JSON web encryption and JSON web keys. So I'm not going to go over this in details, but in a nutshell, it makes sure that the keys and tokens are transferred securely between two parties. Lastly, I'm also going to enable Spring security in this project using the Spring Boot starter security dependency. After adding all these dependencies, if you are using IntelliJ as your ID, make sure to click on the Maven icon on the top right corner to force IntelliJ to download the dependencies. Now it's time to configure the resource server properties. For that, I'm going to open the application.properties file and define a property spring.security.oauthtrue.resourcever.jwt.jwtseturi. So this is the property which will point to the key set URI of key cloak, which is used to verify the access token and ID token we receive from the client. Here you can see this in the diagram in step seven and eight. For this, I'm going to open the open ID configuration of the key cloak server by opening the realm and clicking on the open ID configuration link. And I'm going to copy the value for JWKS URI and paste it inside the file. Okay, we have configured the resource server. Now let's create an endpoint to act as a resource. For that, I'm going to create a package called as controller. And inside the package, I'm going to create a class called as home rest controller. As this is going to be a rest controller, I'm going to add the rest controller annotation from Spring MVC followed by the request mapping. I'm going to expose the endpoint at slash API slash home. And I'm going to also configure the cross variance annotation with value as star. So inside the class, I'm going to create a method called as home, which returns a string. And inside this method, I'm going to return a string called hello. As this is going to handle a get request, I'm going to add the get mapping annotation followed by the response status annotation with value as OK. All right, we configured also the endpoint and the last thing which is remaining is to configure also the spring security. For that, I'm going to create another package called config and inside this package, I'm going to create a class called as security config. All right, so inside the security config class, I'm going to first create a bean. So I'm going to add the bean annotation and this bean is going to be of type security filter chain. So I'm going to type in security filter chain and I'm going to provide the method name as security filter chain and uh, I'm going to provide the method argument as HTTP security. And inside this um, bean definition, I'm going to define the HTTP security dot course settings and in this course settings I'm going to add uh, make uh, I'm going to ask spring security to use the default settings for that I'm going to type in customizer dot customize customizer dot with defaults and uh, so looks like the course method is, go is going to throw an exception so I'm going to add uh, throws signature on top of the on for my method 
and after that i'm going to add the settings for cross site uh, request forgery so i can do that by adding csrf and inside csrf uh, for this csrf usually um, you see that for rest apis we disable the csrf but this is not really uh, uh, this not really applies for all the cases so for this reason i'm just going to define csrf uh, as csrf dot ignore request matchers and i'm going to provide the request matcher as slash api slash home slash star so what this will do is whenever spring security uh, recognizes that it receives a request at path slash api slash home then it will not check for the csrf token for that request for all other requests it will check for the csrf token and uh, so whenever if you want to use cookie uh, authentication in the future then your rest api is uh, secured with csrf uh, capabilities you don't need to worry about including the csrf uh, capabilities in the future so the next part is going to be is going to be about authentic authorization so we're going to configure our spring security application to authenticate all the requests all the incoming requests right so for that i'm going to type authorize http request and inside this i'm going to type in http request and i'm going to type in http requests dot any request dot authenticated and uh, so the next thing i'm going to do is to define the session management and so for that i'm going to do, type dot session management and i'm going to define session dot session creation policy and i'm going to define it as stateless so session creation policy as stateless because as we are using a rest api we don't expect uh, our applications to maintain any state so because um, rest apis are by definition stateless so we're going to define the session management as stateless and the next thing is going to be i'm going to define the uh, resource server capabilities in our security configuration so for that i can type uh, I can type dot oauth resource oauth to resource server, and I'm going to type in oauth to resource server, uh, and I'm going to define oauth to resource server dot jwt, and inside the and here I'm going to also define uh, customizer dot with default so that the default configuration for jwt is applied to the resource server and after that i'm just going to type dot build so now this configuration will build an object of a security filter chain so i'm just going to add a return statement and now we are done with the security configuration for our resource server so now let's go ahead and start our angular application so the on the back end side all the configuration is completed so let's go ahead and run our front end application and test this functionality all right so now i'm inside the angular application inside the terminal i am going to first create a service class which contains logic to make calls to our resource server for that i am going to type ng gs app which is going to create a class called as app service dot ts and app service dot spec dot ts files we are only interested in the app service dot ts file right now so i'm going to open this file and in here we have to make a http get request to our resource server for that i'm going to first inject the http client into the service and after that i'm going to create a method called as hello which will return an observable of string as we are returning a string as a response from our backend Inside the method, I am going to first define HTTP headers by setting the content type as text or plain. The reason being, as I mentioned, we are set we are returning a string as a response. Now I am going to make the get call using the HTTP client to the URL localhost 8080 slash API slash home, and now we are going to pass in the headers as the next argument for the get method. So when the HTTP client makes a get call to this URL, it will include these headers. and also make sure to add the return statement so that it will return the observable so we implemented the service call so what is remaining now is to call the service from our component so for that i am going to open the app component typescript file 
And in here, the first thing I'm going to do is to inject the app service class. And inside the constructor, I'm going to call the hello method from the app service and subscribe to the observable returned by the method. Inside the subscribe method, I'm going to read the response and assign it to a variable called text. Let's store this subscription inside a variable called hello subscription, which is of type subscription. And we have to unsubscribe from the subscription when the component is destroyed. So for that, I'm going to implement on destroy interface for this component. And inside the ng on destroy method, I'm going to type this dot hello subscription dot unsubscribe. This will make sure that there are no active subscriptions lying around, which can cause memory leaks in the application if not given sufficient attention. All right, the last and final thing we are going to do is to bind this variable to our HTML page. So for that, I'm going to add in a h1 tag and bind the text variable as I don't want to write much code and keep this video relevant to OAuth 2 and Keycloak. To display the response from server, we have to refresh the browser after the login. So I'm going to add in the message also here. Okay, so we completed the implementation part on the front end as well as the back end. Now let's start our front end application by typing npm start and make sure that the backend Spring Boot app is also up and running. All right, now let's open an incognito window and open the address localhost 4200 and click on login. Now I'm going to type in my credentials and after clicking on login, you can see the home page. So let's refresh the page and you can see the response from the backend as hello. Now you may ask how did our Angular application recognize the token and send it part of the request to the resource server automatically. So this is done by the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC library automatically. So that is one less thing for us to care as uh, the developers. The client credentials grant flow is mainly used for machine to machine in authorization, which means if the client is a CLI application or a shell script running on a remote server or even a Spring Boot microservice, it doesn't make sense to use a standard username password combination with the login page, like how we implemented in the first two parts of this series. Using the authorization code, code flow grant type or Pixie enhanced authorization code flow grant type. For this reason, when using this flow, the clients will directly make a post request to the authorization server with grant type as client credentials. And it, all, and it will also include the client ID and client secret to authenticate themselves with the authorization server. The authorization server will validate the credentials and if they are valid, will generate an access token and sends it back to the client. When the client needs to access the protected resource, similar to the other grant types, it will include the access token as part of the request header and then the resource server will verify the validity of the token by sending the access token to the authorization server. You may have already observed the client credential flow is significantly simpler compared to the other two authorization code flows. That's because uh, of the confidentiality which is involved uh, based on the client. So now let's go ahead and see a demo on how to implement this grant type. So I have a Spring Boot application up and running already and now I opened a REST client like Postman to make a post call to request the token from the authorization server. So here is the endpoint to which we are making the request. You can get this endpoint by opening the Realm settings inside Keycloak and clicking on the open id configuration link and by copying the token endpoint from the json back to the postman client as part of the post request i am passing the request body with the first field as grant type which is going to be client credentials followed by the field client id i'm going to provide the client id as oauth2 client credentials i already created a client inside keycloak with this client id i will show you how to create this client also shortly the next field is client secret, which is an auto generated secret by the Keycloak server. So now if I click on send, you can see that we receive the access token and we can now use this access token to make a request to our resource server. Okay. I hope you understood how we can request a token from the authorization server through this demo. Now let's go ahead and see how to implement the client credentials grant flow in a Spring Boot application. Okay. All right. So now I'm inside the client section of the OAuth 2 demo realm. And I'm going to create a new client here so that, so I'm going to click on the create client button 
and for the client id i'm going to provide the value as oauth2 client credentials and i'm going to click on next and here as we want to implement the client credentials grant and in here also the client is going to be of type confidential i'm going to toggle on the client authentication and i'm going to disable the authentication flow standard flow and i'm also going to disable the direct access grant and i'm going to select the option service account rules so if we just click on the tooltip here you can see that it allows you to authenticate this client to keycloak and retrieve access token dedicated to this client in terms of all to specification this enables support for client credentials grant so that's what we need so that's why I created I check this option service account rules and I'm going to click on next and I'm going to click on save we'll see the credentials tab if you click on it we can see a client secret which is generated already for us just copy this value we will use it in our Spring Boot application later so we completed the keycloak configuration part now let's go ahead and implement the Spring Boot configuration part. For that I'm going to open our initial starter project on GitHub. So you can download this project from the GitHub link in the description section. And make sure you are on the initial branch to code along and follow the tutorial. So in this part we are going to mainly focus on the OAuth2 client credentials demo project. So if you open this application in your IDE you can see that the application is just a plain old Spring Boot application with the name of microservice application. So now let's configure this application with the, the client credentials flow. So for that the first thing we have to do is to go to the pom.xml file and here we have to add the security capabilities for our application. We can do that by adding the security starter dependency from uh, Spring Boot. So I'm going to do that by adding a dependency inside the dependencies section. So the name of the group ID is going to be org spring framework dot boot and the artifact ID is going to be spring boot security starter security so once this is done let's uh, click on this load maven changes icon so after that i'm going to add one more dependency called as spring boot starter over to resource server so i'm going to replace the security with over to resource server so as we saw before uh, while showing as we saw before in the PKC demo uh, we are going to configure our client credentials as a resource server and um, as a resource server so for this reason we have added this uh, dependency spring boot starter OAuth 2 resource server so again let's load the changes from maven and uh, once this is done uh, we are ready to, to configure our application with the uh, client credentials so the first thing i'm going to do is to create an endpoint inside this application so i'm going to right click on the root package and click on new java class and i'm going to call this as hello controller and let's create this class in a new package so i'm going to add the also the package name before the class name so in this way intellij will automatically create a package called as controller and will uh, keep this uh, hello controller class inside this controller package so the next thing i'm going to do is to create add the rest controller annotation and followed by the request mapping annotation let's uh, expose this request mapping let's give a value as slash api you can already see that i'm using uh, github copilot and it's giving me some suggestions so this is handy um, so i'm just going to make use of this suggestion what i want to have is uh, a get mapping not a request mapping for an endpoint called as hello and i'm going to have uh, i want to have a uh, method called as hello which returns a string and inside this method we have a body called as hello from microservice right so this is uh, the bare minimum we have we want we want to have to test this uh, to test the client credentials um, so this is the endpoint we want to have and the next thing i'm going to do is to create the security configuration so for that i'm going to create a new class called as security config and I'm going to uh, organize this inside a package name called as config so I'm going to type config dot security config and here we have to provide uh, the security configuration to to enable the client credentials flow so for the first thing I'm going to do is 
uh, I'm going to add the configuration annotation and I'm going to uh, copy the configuration security configuration from uh, OAuth to PKCE demo. So I'm going to expand the OAuth to PKCE demo project and I'm going to go to the security config class. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the whole class, con the content inside the class, uh, right up to the import statements because I can use everything as it is. So I'm going to go back to the security config in the client credentials demo project and I'm going to paste this right until the import section. So now we have all the required configuration here. So just as a recap, we have a security filter chain bean, uh, which is the main entry point into while configuring our security configuration in our application. And inside that we are uh, first of all using cores with defaults. Um, now as uh, in PKC demo as application as a resource server is being accessed by an Angular application we were uh, enabling course but as this is a client credentials um, this application only uh, deals with client credentials that means uh, this application will be accessed only by some API clients or maybe another microservice we don't really need to enable course so for that what we can do is uh, we can disable course by by typing course.disable. So I'm going to inline this uh, Lambda expression with a method reference. Uh, and uh, next we have CSRF and again is the same case as this is completely accessed by uh, another API client or maybe another microservice. We can also disable CSRF. I'm going to uh, replace this ignore request matchers with the method called disable. And I'm also going to inline this uh, Lambda with uh, method reference and uh, we can keep uh, rest all configuration as it is. So we are going to authorize all the request, all the incoming requests using this HTTP request dot any request dot authenticated method and uh, coming to the session management. We are still uh, want to have stateless session in your in our application because this is a REST API. And finally, we are going to enable the OAuth to resource server capabilities using the JWT method and by providing the default configuration. So let's uh, now deal with the configuration part in the application dot properties file. So I'm going to open the and here we need to add a property for JSON web key set URI and here, so we can uh, look this up from the again we can, again we can look this up from the auth to PKC demo project I'm going to go to the application dot properties file and I'm going to copy this whole property which is defined inside the application dot properties and I'm going to paste this inside the application dot properties of client credentials demo project and lastly, I'm going to just to be sure that we don't use the same existing port. I'm going to add the server dot port as 8083. So once this is done, we can start up our application and we can press the client credentials grant type. All right. So I've opened the Postman client and in here I've already configured the URI of the endpoint which we have created before. So I'm trying to call the localhost 8083 slash API slash hello endpoint. So this is going to be a get request and uh, we have to add the uh, JWT token to our authorization headers. So for that I'm going to open the authorization header tab. And here I'm going to request a token from Keycloak to start the client credentials grant, uh, grant type. So for that, I'm just going to scroll down until the configure new token section. And in here, I'm going to provide the client ID of the client I've created in the previous section. And I'm also going to provide the client secret. So let me show you how to get the client secret. If I open Keycloak here and I'm going to open the client which I've created uh, before. So this is going to be OAuth to client credentials. And in here, I'm going to go to the credentials tab and I'm just going to copy the client secret and then paste it here. And now I'm going to click on the button, get new access token. And now you can see that I received a new access token and I'm going to now click on the send button. And you can see that we received the response hello from microservice. So let's try to tamper with this token. So I'm just going to delete a part of this token and then try to send another request to test if, if our endpoint is really secured or not. So I'm just going to press the send button again. And now you can see that we are getting a 401 unauthorized error. So I hope the client credentials grant, uh, grant type is clear for you. So that's it for this video. 
I hope you learned about key cloak and how to implement different types of grant types using key cloak. So I'll see you in the next video. Until then, happy learning techies.